All right, uh, very good evening to each and every one of you, distinguished guests, friends. Thank you very much for having your time here today. So today's seminar is all about SMU and Ethereum collaboration, made only possible by the collaboration with White Hat Society, part of the CCA uh, co-curricular activity in SMU. So we're trying to keep it today as casual and as informal as possible. So a couple of agendas I'd like to address first would be the Ethereum team, made up of Gavin, George, Ken, Marek, We'll be addressing each and every one of you what they do and to get a better understanding of what blockchain technology is all about. Following which, we will have an amazing dinner break organized by Belly France just right outside. And uh, after which, after the dinner, Digis Global will actually be interesting to you what do they do and share their experience of working along with an amazing firm like Ethereum. Next up, I've lined up two guest speakers for you. First off, we will have Dr. Yuna Steiner, which is here she is. She's a co-founder of Provenance, which is a, a London company. She will explain more about what she do and also share her experience with Ethereum herself. Next up, uh, we'll end off the seminar with a guest speaker of Kelvin So. Some of you may know him in the local scene. He's a cryptocurrency consultant for the company Qmin. And after we'll be addressing QA. So I'm sure you might have seen this little slip of paper right in front of you. This slip of paper actually is a short. I'm trying to, I made it as short as possible. Uh, it's a Google form link where you can submit questions at any point of time during the seminar. Or if you'd like to raise your hand and like to give the questions, by all means. So I'm quite sure today some of you might come with a couple of questions like, what exactly is blockchain technology? Or for some business owners, you might ask, what can this technology do for me? Alternatively, you might be wondering, what kind of businesses out there that exist now are actually empowered by the blockchain technology. So with that, I would like to invite the Ethereum team, Gavin and George, to explain further. Gavin and George, please. Okay. Um, so hello, everyone. Uh, my name is George Hallam. I'm the Business and Partnership Director at Ethereum. Uh, my role there is essentially working with people inside the ecosystem, so people like Digital Global, Provenance and all the other sort of incredible projects that are being built on top of Ethereum. Um, before I start, I'd like to say thank you ever so much to Sean, who has organized the event uh, along with Digits Global, so Dawe, Anthony, uh, Tio, Casey. Uh, we just give them another round of applause to say thank you. <laughs> really, really appreciate, it. appreciate it from our end, so uh, yeah, cheers to that. Okay, so with Ethereum, um, a lot of people ask the question, why? why? Why does Ethereum need to exist? Why are we as a team putting our time and effort into, into building this system, this incredibly complicated system? Um, and what it really comes down to is the systems that we have in place today, these, these uh, hub and spoke models, uh, centralized entities. And they work. They work. They work pretty well, but they're not perfect. And there are some elements which are not satisfactory. They, they, you, you could do better. Um, so, for instance, if you look at the banking system, the banking system is by definition centralized. You, you work hard every day, you, you um, create value in your life, and you store it at a bank. And this, you would expect, should be kept safe. Um, you should be able to have people going into that store of value and taking your money. But that happens. I mean, uh, Cyprus is a great example. We all know what happened there. Um, and with Belgium as well, they uh, use retroactive tax laws to physically take money from people's bank accounts. Now, for me, that's not on. Um, and with a centralized system, uh, that, 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 that is by de facto what's going to happen. So uh, with a decentralized system, you, you can effectively stop that. Um, another example would be Apple, the Apple, Apple App Store. So when you're a developer, when you're building um, some sort of new incredible application, uh, you want people to use it, you want to enrich their lives. They want to have a reason to buy, a reason to enter into the system. The problem is, is if you submit that to the Apple App Store, and for whatever reason, a couple of people there don't like it, then you're not able to have your app on the Apple App Store. Uh, which means that you're not able to, to, to give your, your application that you spend a lot of time and money building uh, to, to people who want to use it. Uh, you're effectively censoring an application. And again, that's another issue with the centralized system is you have these group of people in control who can stop you uh, from, from, from doing things that you want to do. Uh, another example is Facebook, you know, with the client server model that you have. So you know, when, you, when you log on to Facebook, you're asking permission to access your profile. You're asking permission to see your photos, photos that when you've uploaded to Facebook, you no longer own. Um, those, 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 you know, it's uh, you know asking permission to talk to your friends, and okay, it's great, it's a free service, but is it really free? Because 
when you're uploading all that information, it's being sold off to governments, it's being sold off to organizations, um, and you yourself become the product, and you don't really get a choice in it. They have the monopoly in social social networks. Um, so again, you know, there should be an alternative way, perhaps a way where even you could sell your personal information yourself and monetize that. And finally as well, centralized models, they have a single point of attack. Um, we all know what happened with iCloud and celebrities uh, losing their, their private photos and being published uh, around the world for everyone to see. Um, that's, that's not satisfactory at all. You, know, you trust Apple, you trust the people who are, who are building these systems to keep your information safe, keep your data safe. Um, same, with, same with Dropbox as well. You know, when, you, when, you, when you upload a files, then you expect them not to pass this across the government. You expect them to always wake up on the right side of the bed every morning. And you, know, you have this human element of failure. Which is very much an issue for, uh, for centralized entities. So, you know, what is Ethereum? Um, Ethereum itself is a 100% open source entity. Um, it's, a, it's a wild computer. It's a computer where everyone shares the same state. So, anything that happens on one part happens on anything else. And that gives some very, very interesting um, potential to the system itself. Um, it it's allows people to build and distribute their own decentralized applications, or dApps, uh, which we'll talk a little bit more about through, through, through the presentation itself. So, um, there's no middlemen on sort of Ethereum as well. So that means instantly you're saving on costs. Previously, you would have had to have trusted authorities to do certain elements of your business logic. But now, you can put them on top of this decentralized blockchain system. Uh, and you don't have to, to worry about that. You're, you're saving a huge amount of money. Um, and this is another thing with Ethereum as well. Ethereum is built on sort of a Turing complete scripting language, which essentially means that uh, it's limitless in terms of potential of what you can do with it. Uh, you could build, you could build in-game economies, uh, financial systems. People are building entire financial exchanges out of these things called smart contracts. And smart contracts are these elements of logic that, that go on top of the blockchain itself, uh, and when they are used together with a front-facing user interface, uh, you have the decentralized application. Um, Ethereum is 100% peer-to-peer, which means that uh, the network is distributed, so it's not centralized by default. Um, to, to shut down Ethereum, you'd effectively have to shut down the whole of the internet. Um, it's encrypted and it's censorship proof, which also sort of plays into that. Um, Ethereum offers centralized consensus at scale. Uh, we have obviously intentions to improve scaling over time, um, but it allows people to, to interact with the system very, very easily. Through our pre-sale back in 2014, we raised 15.4 million US dollars. Uh, at the time, it was the second largest crowd sale ever. It's now unfortunately the third. Um, but, uh, but yes, we raised them, and it was all in Bitcoin as well. So over 9,000 people took part, and some of them obviously are in this room. Um, and we're very grateful for everyone who took part in that. Uh, the foundation, uh, the, the entity which is responsible for delivering the Ethereum software, is non-profit. Uh, so we have no profit motive. Uh, and any, we're not going to ask for money or anything like that. Um, we've got the money and we want to build the system itself. Um, and you know, the logical conclusion, or what we want to bring, is the logical conclusion of the internet. Uh, how many developers are in the room? You just put your hands up if you're a developer. Okay, so slightly more than I expected. Um, but uh, yeah, so this is important as well, because people aren't going to use Ethereum unless it's easy to use. I mean, if you have this sort of esoteric system that no one's ever heard before and it takes a year to learn, that just sets us back a year. So what we've done is we've uh, looked at what people like to use today for applications, and we've tried to essentially use that as a guide for how we did build the Ethereum system itself. So uh, for the front end, it's exactly the same as any sort of website or application that you see today. You can use HTML, you can use JavaScript, Meteor, Angular, um, anything like that. It's, it's, it's incredibly simple. And this then connects through to the, uh, to the, to, to the back end, which is uh, based on Two different languages at this time. Um, we have Solidity, which is JavaScript-like, and we have Python, uh, Python um, sorry, Serpent, which is Python-like. And then you just connect the two together, and you have yourself a smart contract connected to the front end, which creates a DAO. Um, so, and Ethereum is built on the blockchain. You know, some of you, I mean, who knows? Who, who, who here could think they could you know, give a really good definition of what a blockchain is? It's not easy. Uh, blockchains are very, very complicated things. Um, but Vitalik has a pretty good definition. Uh, Vitalik is the sort of the, the uh, person who came up with the original idea of the co-founder. Um, so a blockchain um, is essentially a magic computer that anyone can upload programs to, uh, and leave those programs to self execute where um, the current and all previous states um, of, of all programs on the network are 
always publicly visible, um, which leads to effectively you know, a guarantee or a very strong crypto economic guarantee um, of oops, sorry. Uh, Mr. A strong crypto economically secured guarantee um, uh, that programs running on the chain will continue to run in exactly the way the blockchain protocol specifies. So what does that mean? Well, the first section, uh, you know, it's, it's open to everyone. So, so you know, uh, anyone can upload programs to it. Anyone can, can use those programs once they've been uploaded. Um, the second section, you know, with the, the current or previous states being, being also publicly visible, this means that if you want to look at the blockchain, if you want to audit a smart contract, uh, these little pieces of logic, then anyone can look at that and you can be sure that it's going to be doing what you expect it to be doing. Um, and finally, you have this, this crypto economically secure sort of guarantee um, that these programs that you upload will run exactly as you've specified with no deviance at all um, forever or as long as the blockchain exists, which is you know, as long as it has reasonable financial backing is effectively correct. Um, use cases. Now, this is the important thing about Ethereum because without the ecosystem, without people building on top of Ethereum, it may as well not exist. Um, the whole point of it is to allow people to build uh, new incredible systems to disrupt uh, systems that already exist today and to, yeah, to, to bring decentralization to, to, to the world itself. Um, so, you know, as, as I said, Ethereum is built with the Turing complete scripting language, so anything can be built. Um, here's a few sort of examples. Um, I guess you can see in the, uh, in the picture there is a guy called John. Uh, John works for a company called Airlock Emmy. And what, as you can see in that picture as well, you've got a little door handle, uh, which is connected to a Raspberry Pi, which is hidden over there, uh, which is running an Ethereum node. Um, and and what, you know, what would be the use for that? So effectively, you'd, uh, you'd have your, your mobile phone, which would have a version of the Ethereum client running. Uh, you'd, you'd have a token, which is indicative of, say, entry to a house, like a key. You'd scan your phone against the door handle, and you'd have access to the house. And, and what's the use case for this? Well, think of something like a decentralized Airbnb, where you know you give someone a token for a certain, you know, to take it back when they when, when their time is up, um, and then you can allow them access to a house, to an abode, for a specific amount of time, without the need for a centralized service to look after all of that, to look after the details. Um, another example, obviously, is uh, Digits Global. The guys who are working here tonight. It's an incredible idea. Um, it's an entirely new way of representing gold in, in a financial system. So you send Digits Global, or say a kilogram of gold, um, they will they will audit that gold, they'll weigh it, they'll put it in one of their uh, vault, in one of the partner vaults anywhere around the world. Uh, and that gold is then digitized and created as a token on top of the Ethereum network. Um, let's just say each gram of gold from that kilogram is worth one token. So you have a thousand tokens. You can then use that token to bootstrap your own currency, to bootstrap a business, um, to add value into the system where there wasn't previously value before. I mean, it's been a while since we've had a gold standard, but you know, it can happen. Um, and then at the end of it, if you want to redeem those tokens back for the gold, you simply, I think there's a five gram minimum, minimum or something like that, but you send the tokens back to Digital Global, they're cut off five grams and send it to you in the mail. It's an incredible system and it's all transparent, anyone can see it. Um, and it's probably a lot better than the paper system that exists today. I'm sure a lot of people know that there's a lot of forgery and things going on with that. Um, What's another good one? Uh, let's talk about Augur. Who here? Well, I guess a lot of you have probably heard about Augur. They're one of the uh, louder um, groups that are building their, their, their technological stack on top of Ethereum. And the way Augur works essentially is it's a, it's a prediction market. So you, you go onto the Augur website and someone asks a question and you vote on the answer. So you say, you know, who's going to be the next US president? Um, it's going to be Hillary Clinton, it's going to be uh, Rand Paul, or whoever. Um, and whoever is right at the end of it collects the value of the worth. Obviously, it has a cost to make, to make the vote, but they collect the value at the end of it. So the losers lose their money and the winners gain money. So you're incentivized to be correct, which means you have this incredible system where you can crowdsource information of what's going on in the world. The potential for this is just incredible. Um, oh, and obviously in terms of big partners as well, I guess a lot of you probably know about IBM. Uh, they've been using Ethereum for a project Addict, uh, which is an Internet of Things system. It so transpires that Ethereum is obviously because it's incredibly secure, the perfect underlying mechanism for an Internet of Things um, um, entity. So you, know, you wouldn't want someone hacking into your fridge or hacking into your toaster and burning your house down. Um, but the way that Ethereum is, is what people, the way that Ethereum works means that this is not possible. Um, and the one of the sort of the lowest hanging fruits when it comes to what you'd want to do with Ethereum is, is tokenization and you know, crowdfunding on top of that as well. Um, 
I guess a lot of you in here have probably participated um, in a Kickstarter um, sort of uh, campaign or whatever. Um, it's great, you know. Imagine you know buying the Oculus Rift when it first came out, three hundred dollars. You get this amazing piece of technology. The only problem is, is um, you know that technology became very quickly obsolete. They released two new versions since then, um, and well, the biggest one for me is that if you bought three hundred dollars worth of stock in Oculus Rift before the Facebook Facebook bought in, you would have got sixty thousand dollars back. Sixty thousand dollars, and that, that's a lot of money. Um, and with the current system that exists today, you don't get the opportunity to buy stocks in something which is obviously incredible. Um, so what you could do with Ethereum, and there is already one being created, it's called WaveFund, being built by a guy called Nick Dodson, a very talented developer. I really recommend you check it out. And, and essentially what you can do is it's, it's a platform where you can, you can do the old model if you want to. You can you know, sell sort of physical hardware. Um, or you can create your own shares, bootstrap your business, um, and you know, offer those shares to people and reward them for helping you early on in your campaign. Um, so I think that's, that's really, really important. And another sort of a great thing is, is node incentivization. So, all that really comes down to, for me at least, is uh, green green energy, sort of centralized energy on, on the network. So in the future, I think we can all agree that solar power, solar panels, and solar power is going to be a thing. Um, they've massively increased efficiency. Uh, it's very much at the point now where, well, as we all know, it's more economically viable than coal power. So we're going to see gradually over time more and more people having solar panels on their houses, solar panels on their businesses, uh, maybe a few windmills as well. Um, but the current grids that exist in the world today are not capable of handling that. Um, there, there's no system in place to have a really easy buyback sell system um, for, for, for the power. So imagine if you were to create an Ethereum token, it's called Energy Coin or something on top of Ethereum, and you know you have a, a, um, a, a kilowatt of electricity is created, you create one Energy Coin, and each time a kilowatt of energy is consumed, you destroy an Energy Coin. So what you can do is you can have your, your housing system connected to a decentralized exchange where you can have an AI at your house which buys and sells your electricity to optimize the price, uh, which is way, way, way more efficient than anything that exists today. Um, and this, is, this again is going to be a really, really big thing. Um, reputation. Now, this is not something that you'd necessarily think could be you know, utilized for Ethereum. Um, a good example of uh, something or a reputation that is not really characterized in the Western world or, or digitally is this thing called Charma. And Charma is big in Kenya, and it's essentially where uh, people don't have collateral, they don't have necessarily houses or cars they can use to put down to get a loan. Um, so what they do is they'll get a group of friends, of respected members of the community, and they'll vouch their, their, their personal reputations on this person being able to get some funding. Because you'd have maybe 12 people bringing together to say, I want this guy to be able to get access to 10,000 uh, pounds or something like that. Um, and Previously, well, up until now, that hasn't been possible to do on, on a computer. But now what you can do is you could actually have someone's reputation, a reputation which can carry from, from one group to another. Everything on Ethereum is modular. Everything can work together. Uh, so you can have a reputation that you've created on decentralized eBay, and you know, which is also been, been used on a, you know, decentralized Airbnb. Uh, and you can use that reputation as it has value to stake out for someone else so they can get a loan. And then you know, if they screw you over, then you lose your reputation. Um, but again, it's an entirely new system that hasn't been done before. Uh, now, to have these, these great ideas, to have these great applications working, you need to have um, a portal which an average computer user can, can access uh, these, these incredibly powerful systems. Um, you know, right now, as the Ethereum is looking to launch, we'll have a command line interface. And that's, uh, that's good for developers in the early stages, but it's not good enough for people like my mum, who wouldn't even know what to do uh, if they were faced with a command line interface. So we have the intention of building MIST. We've already got uh, proof of concepts out. It's available. You can download it. You can have a look at it. Uh, and essentially, it's, it's, I guess, comparable to Netscape when the early internet was first created. It suddenly makes it accessible to a much, much larger population. Um, and as you can see here, you've got various different things. So you can, you can have your various different wallets holding different values or different things. Uh, you can have people that you're talking to through, say, Whisper, which is a project Gauss built, which is a sort of dark messaging service. Um, you could have, say, drought insurance. Like that. I mean, talk, talking about auger, you can crowdsource information to say, is there a drought in this area? Yes, I haven't been able to water my, my flowers for, for six months. Therefore, you know that you know there is a drought, and you can use that information to create insurance. Uh, you can have all the sort of applications running on here. It just makes it incredibly easy to interface with things built on top of Ethereum. Um, story so far. So Ethereum has had a... Um, well, it seems like forever. I mean, you know, we've been doing this for only, only sort of a year and a half now, but it's been an incredible journey. We've done so much. 
And um, it started in November 2013 when Vitalik wrote uh, the white paper. Uh, and immediately, some of the more intelligent members of the, of the crypto community sort of found that and instantly saw its value. Uh, so Gab, Jeff especially, is sort of the original founders with Vitalik. Um, and they built clients. They, they, they built it out. So Vitalik built uh, Pythereum, which is the, the Python version, Python clients of Ethereum. Gab built his C++ client, Aleph Zero, uh, which is a great development tool and has you know, sort of been consolidated with Mix, the IDE. Uh, and Jeff built Go, which will form Mist, which you saw previously, uh, and is sort of the security audited client that we'll be releasing in the next few weeks when we launch. Um, we're currently going to also proof of concept. We've just passed that now. Uh, we're currently on the Olympic testnet. And I really, really, uh, you know, it'd be great if you guys you know, want to engage with Ethereum, join the testnet. Um, I can show you sort of net stats later on if you like and see what's going on there. No, maybe not. <laughs> we did we did have a fork um, a couple of days ago, uh, but that's been sorted now. It's all fixed. So, uh, you, know, and, you know, we still have a bounty available as well. I mean, if anyone is able to fork the network again, we'll give you 20,000 Ether. So have a stamp, have a go, and get some free Ether. Um, and as I said previously, the community is probably one of the most important things about Ethereum. Uh, these guys are the building the stuff around, look at the core uh, elements that we're building. You've got people building um, JS, uh, Node.js clients, uh, Martin over in Indiana. Uh, you've got Roman in Israel who's building um, a, a Java client, Ethereum J. And there's also Haskell implementations, Objective-C's, Clojure. I'm not sure if they're still being um, pushed in quite the same way they were originally, but you know they're out there. And we implore people to build more interesting things on top of Ethereum. Um, these are all implementation of Gav's yellow paper, which is the sort of scientific interpretation of Ethereum. Um, and, and as, as I said, the community is incredibly important. Ethereum probably has the biggest crypto community apart from Bitcoin itself in the world. In fact, it does. It definitely does. Uh, Ethereum is definitely the, the second largest crypto entity. There's no, no one else comes close. We've got 81 meetups around the world um, with well over 6,000 people taking part. And you are, you are some of them. Um, these people are all interested about Ethereum. They're all thinking about ideas. I'm sure that this presentation is uh, giving you some ideas or some things that you might want to build on top of Ethereum. Um, in terms of social media, uh, social media metrics, uh, we have 100,000 unique views on our website a month, which is great. Uh, over 14,000 followers on Twitter, um, and, and most importantly, over a hundred entities already in the open. That's not even including the stealth ones that I haven't been able to talk to or don't want to talk to me yet. A um, hundred entities building on top of the Ethereum stack, and we haven't even launched yet. So there's a lot of people who really believe in what we're doing. Um, and I hope you guys too, uh, do too. Uh, I really hope some of you are able to go over here and sort of, you know, have a chat with the digital label, see what they're kind of doing. I mean, they're based in Singapore, they're a really great bunch of guys. Um, and I'll leave you with a few questions. Um, so, you know, what, what if applications were modular? So I talked about reputation and, and, uh, and, and applications on Ethereum being modular, but what if you were able to take your, your, your reputation from decentralized eBay and carry it across to decentralized Airbnb, there's, there's value in that. If, if you enter into eBay today, you won't be able to buy certain things on top of eBay because you haven't had enough previous transactions for people to trust you. So all of a sudden, you can carry that trust around with you to different elements. It's like a, a trust passport. Um, as I said with the, with the crowdfunding, what if anyone could bootstrap their business? What if anyone could produce shares? Right now, it's incredibly expensive and incredibly <laughs> difficult to, to have, a share, have shares in your, on your business. Um, it's almost just not viable for the majority of SMEs. Uh, but now you can do it incredibly easy with Ethereum. Um, what if the unbanked can have access to credit? Uh, again, that goes back to the Charmer thing, but the unbanked in general, Ethereum is incredibly powerful for financial tools. You can build multi-sig wallets that are you know, almost you know, technically impossible to have. Um, you can build all sorts of various systems uh, which, which you would usually traditionally have from a bank, but have them on top of Ethereum. And because Ethereum is open to everyone, it means anyone can access it. Um, in order today's disruptive companies get disrupted, I think Gav is going to sort of cover a little bit about this uh, in his presentation. But think about Uber, uh, and then imagine Uber being replaced not by this this centralized entity of a bunch of guys making billions, um, but actually giving a, a lot more of that money back to the drivers themselves. Uh, and you have this decentralized autonomous organization, a DAO, running on top of the Ethereum network um, and allowing the majority of the of the value to flow to the people who deserve it. Um, and finally, what if the internet became secure again? As I said, with, with IBM, they identified Ethereum as the most secure element they could possibly find to run an internet of things platform. Um, yeah, and we're about to find out. So thank you very much for listening, guys. Um, you want to go straight on, Gavin? Do you have any questions? I think we can take a few questions. I'll take me a minute, too. Sure. Um, so from that presentation, does anyone have any specific questions? 
Yep. Um, fantastic presentation. I love it. Uh, but one question struck my head. Um, what's the downside? What's the downside? What's the downside? Is there a downside? So Ethereum, uh, you know, you said, I said it's a world computer. It's not an incredibly powerful world computer. Um, it's probably got the computational equivalent of a late 1990s, early 2000s smartphone. So you're not going to be uh, you know, in time when we sort out scalability, when we you know figure out ways of uh, basically increasing its computational power. Uh, you will certainly be able to um, run more powerful things on top of it. But for now, it's very much limited by its computational power. Um, but at the same time, that's not what it's all about. Uh, it's about creating trust on the network. It's about being able to provably and without doubt being able to run systems um, and allow people to interact with those systems in trustless ways. Okay, yeah. Any other questions? Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, what questions have the smartest critics been asking? Well, there's one. Um, what else do people sort of detract from us? Okay, so what, a little bit is why Ethereum when compared to something like Ripple? Ripple has also been gaining massive traction. Uh, apart, apart from us, Ripple is probably the other sort of large cryptocurrency that's going to do well moving forward. Um, Ripple. Uh, is definitely a capacitor with Ethereum that they are trying to do slightly different things to us. Uh, we can do what they do. And the difference being is that with Ripple, if you want to conform to KYC AML, I guess you've already heard about uh, some of the issues they had with that a couple of weeks ago. Um, but you can't do it with inside the protocol itself. Whereas with Ethereum, if you want to adhere to KYC AML, uh, you can build it into your smart contract. You can have it all inside the protocol, which is again saving massively on costs. And because the blockchain is you know, publicly viewable and anyone can see it, uh, it's very easy for regulator, regulators, lawmakers to plug into your portion of the blockchain that you're using uh, and have them gather the relevant data that they need to make sure you're adhering to the, the laws of the country you're abiding. Uh, another question was, I'll leave some of these for Gab because it's ready to go. Uh, what was the name of the app that allows you to bootstrap your business and who is the developer behind it? Uh, Han, that is called Wayfund, W-E-I-F-U-N-D. Uh, and the guy who's building is called Nick Dodson. Uh, if you can come meet me wherever you are after, the, after this uh, presentation, I'd, I'd be happy to uh, Oh, great, I'd be happy to sort that out. Um, and one last one, blockchain use cases for financial industries, banking and insurance. Oh, geez, there's just millions. I mean, this is the thing. You have this, this element of trust that you weren't able to have previously with banking. You don't need central authorities anymore. Um, so you can build centralized exchanges. You can build P2P insurance. We have crowdfunding for insurance. So imagine you've got a guy in Rwanda who wants to uh, insure his crops, and you can have various different people in this room even bidding to give him the best insurance policy instead of having to do it through uh, a large insurance organization. So you say he pays you five pounds a year, uh, you have to pay him back 500 pounds if, uh, if he has to claim on his insurance, maybe using satellite data to see if there's a, a drought uh, or using uh, auger to find out if there's a drought. Um, yeah, the list is endless. Again, come speak to me afterwards. I'll try not to take up too much time. I think it's probably enough for now. I'm happy to do some more later. But yeah, thank you very much, guys. Cheers for listening. Cheers. Hi everyone, thanks for coming. Um, my name is uh, Gavin Wood, I'm the CTO of Ethereum. George mentioned I'm one of the early guys. I came to Ethereum uh, mid-December 2013, so it's about a month after the original white paper was published. Um, and I wrote the first, I would argue the first working client. There's, there's some uh, discussion between me and Jeff, but we'll leave that for later. Subtle points to be, to be made. Um, Thanks for doing the hard work of introducing uh, roughly what Ethereum is, George. Um, I'm going to take a much more sort of circumspect route and sort of try and give you a feeling for what sort of things might happen in the future because of Ethereum. And I'm not going to limit myself to Ethereum, but, you know, technologies like Ethereum. Where's tech going and how's it going to interact with trade? Um, so this is a talk I very quickly uh, um, wrote up, but um, I did a, a blog post on this. Uh, of months ago, just sort of thoughts around this, around this theme. Um, oh, am I going to be able to? Just, uh, this is this should just put points in the round for a whole bunch of people. Sure, have you got any? Oh, come on. I think it's because of the, the allow. Oh, oh right. Right. Yeah, you're going. Uh, check it out. <clears throat> Um, right, so I want to build the scene. Um, where has computing gone? Let's say over the last about 50 years. Um, 
we started with lots of individual computers. They solved mathematical problems. Um, first computers were calculators, of course, back in sort of, uh, the uh, the forties. Um, and eventually, we got to the point of having multi-user systems, so like mainframes, people could log on, but it was still the same computer. Um, not long after that, these mainframes turned into servers, and there were clients that would connect to the servers, but it was a very much a, um, a heterogeneous relationship, an asymmetrical relationship. Clients were uh, clients did different things. Servers were were the authority. Clients were very clearly sort of subordinate, and would take whatever data they need from the server. Um, over the past, well, let's say late nineties, early early noughties, we've seen um, many more systems that are peer to peer. So you know, Napster is a really obvious early one, BitTorrent, and these these systems have proved themselves to be a lot more resilient for doing the same jobs. Let's think about software development. In the early days, there were just you know individual coders, and these guys, you know, like Donald and Luke, I'm thinking, you know, these guys just coded entire operating systems on their own. Um, over time, when software became more important for doing all sorts of other things, uh, you know, bigger things, uh, organizations needed it, software development departments. Um, how were they managed? Well, they were managed typically in a strict hierarchy. So there was an architect at the top, and then there were sort of project leaders beneath him, and blah, 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 blah. And if you go to places like IBM, it's still more or less like this. Um, now, Eric Raymond, a chap that did a, a book called The Mythical Man Month back in the 90s, he did another book called The Cathedral and the Bazaar. It started off as just a little essay, but basically he said, um, these companies are doing this, this, this one way of doing things. Um, actually, an open source free software movement, you know, the GNU movement, um, Richard Stallman, um, he did things in roughly the same way. But these other guys, these crazy guys, people like Linus Tavolz, they were developing software in a different way. And he called this model the bizarre, the bizarre model. The Zara model is basically sort of um, much more decentralized. There's no specific architecture. People who write the code basically get to make the decisions. Lots of people writing code, lots of decisions being made, but somehow it all sort of comes together. Why does it come together? Well, probably um, very good communication. Um, people tend, tend to know what the other moving elements are thinking. Um, over time, this has sort of progressed further, even more decentralized into you know, the GitHub style, where basically there are, 50, 100 forks of the same project, all going in their own direction. And then basically the, 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 uh, they submit pull requests on each one and sort of there's, there's horizontal gene transfer on the list of all these different beasts. Let's think of the progression of governance over the past, I don't know, whatever, 500,000 years. Um, kind of started with anarchy, everyone sort of, you know, desperately trying to, to get by on their own. A strong individual turns up, you get a monarchy or a fiefdom. Um, Eventually, trade happens, mer the merchant class forms, an aristocracy forms, and you get this sort of governance of, of a more pluralistic governance, but still very much kind of centralized in, in, a, in a particular group. And then sort of in theory, we've moved to a, a more democratic thing where governance is, is much more spread out. Um, the democracy we have at the moment isn't all that much like what was going on in, in Greece, of course, back in the, uh, you know, 100 BC, but it's certainly, um, it's certainly more pluralistic. Let's think about communication. Communication originally sort of started off just people talk to each other. There wasn't much else, the travelers going around. But basically, there was a very limited amount. Then we sort of went into the printing press, radio, television, and we've got this sort of massive one-to-many communication system. Come along the internet, and suddenly we can all talk to each other very easily on a one-to-one basis. -one, well, I should really say many-to-many -many basis. We can all talk, and we can broadcast to uh, anyone else or a subgroup thereof. And maybe in the future, we will uh, we'll go all the way and have a mobile mesh. So people are now talking about sort of mesh networking um, where you don't actually need an internet connection. You just need a Bluetooth or a local, a local uh, wireless connection. You'll be able to sort of be a node on the network. Of course, we see this, um, all of the lovely visualizations with different nodes running around. You've got the, the lines joining them up. Um, very modern sort of um, sort of image. Um, distance sales, we see a similar pattern. Um, originally, of, you know, pretty close to zero distance sales, like back of the magazine, you sort of ring them up. And, uh, nobody really wanted to, uh, to take much uh, part in that early 90s. I did it, I think, probably you know, ordering some software or something. But, um, then we get Amazon, right? The internet enables Amazon. Now, Amazon um, notably is uh, one matchmaker, one merchant, right? So it's a single point. You go to Amazon, you can buy, you can find anything, right? But they're the guys that sell it to you. 
So you go to them, they say, yeah, you can buy it off us and here's, here's how much you need to pay. Now we've got Amazon Marketplace and eBay, one matchmaker, but many merchants, right? So this is a fundamental change in how trade is happening. We're going to someone and rather than them selling us the good and the trade being entirely conducted by them, rather we're going to them and they're directing us to somebody else. Now, these guys manage the process, so it still feels very homogenous between different merchants. But nonetheless, there is very clear decentralization going on. If I'm a merchant, I want to sell a commodity or a good. I can go advertise it on Amazon Marketplace or eBay, and people can be drawn to me through that. Something's going to happen next, though. And the thing that's going to happen next, I don't know what it's called, but it's going to be no matchmakers and still many merchants. Full decentralization. So the general theme, or perhaps even a natural order, is to go from nothing into um, in, into a, a strict ordering, centralization. And we see this happening across the board. I'm going to argue. You're free to uh, argue later uh, against me. Um, and once that order has been set up, then this sets the scene for decentralization that happens a step at a time. But ultimately, we end up with infrastructure that allows um, a decentralized thing. Why? Because decentralization, a decentralized system, is more efficient, it's more scalable, and it's resilient against attack. My argument is that trade is going to suffer in the same way. Uberization, some people call it. eBay, I think, is a, is a reasonably good um, example of, of this happening sort of much earlier on. Decentralized marketplace. Whereas once people found it, small shops and individuals found it very hard to, uh, to trade across the board, um, eBay gave them a platform to do that. And on eBay, there are loads and loads of these things, loads and loads of small shops, individuals selling their goods, selling their goods. Amazon Marketplace, a later, a later thing, but it, same basic idea. Um, we've got a bunch of uh, kind of runaway successes, I, I'd say. Um, Uber and Airbnb, to name two, right? Decentralized um, driver, taxi, whatever. A decentralized hotel, hostelry. Um, there's one I saw in London. I don't know how popular it is. Um, the, across the world, but TaskRabbit allows this for um, sort of manual labor, semi-skilled stuff. And I guess there's Mechanical Turk as well. Um, in all of these, we've seen the same pattern, right? We've seen um, uh, people go to the internet, to a, um, a normally very centralized body, a centralized uh, corporation that allows them to buy some good or some service, classic Amazon. And then we've seen that model Effectively, the internet, uh, the internet bit has remained the same, the interface bit has remained the same, but the underlying provision of services and goods has become decentralized. So in the future, maybe that matchmaking element is the final piece of the puzzle to be removed and commoditized. Why is it not removed yet? Mainly, I will argue, because of trust. That's what Amazon provides for Amazon Marketplace. That's what eBay provides for the decentralized auction system. That's what Uber provides for uh, decentralized taxis. They provide a way for me to be reasonably sure that the good or the service, when it comes, is going to be what I think it was. Right? These guys turn digital into real. That's how I can be sure that, that what is digitally said is going to be what really is. So where does Ethereum fit into all of this? Where does this general blockchain movement fit into all of this? Well, for Bitcoin, the blockchain provided the same thing, right? It said, right, there's this digital thing called money, and we're going to make this, we're going to provide real guarantees on this thing. We're going to provide the guarantee, like physical goods, that cannot be duplicated at will. It's a level of trust, or at least it replaces trust, depending on how you look at it. So Ethereum says, right, well, let's just let's just generalize this completely rather than just talking about money or tokens or or numbers that can't be that can only be moved from one place to another. Let's talk about it in general. Trust in general. Ethereum delivers trust as a commodity. Now, this is a weird thing because it's never happened before. Right. Like kind of the government in the early days of like civil order delivered trust through contract law as a commodity, kind of. And it's that sort of thing. This is why we have smart contracts, right? It's, it's this thing delivered into the digital era. It provides um, a strong, uncorruptible link between reality and digital. 
And it's something that the internet could never have provided before. The internet was great for decentralizing communication, but it could never decentralize agreements. And Ethereum does this. Another way of looking at it is, of course, programmable value, the notion of smart contracts and guaranteed semantics George mentioned um, earlier. You can, you can write a program and you'd be guaranteed that that program will run in the way that you expect it to run. But one of the really important things about Ethereum is the fact that it's a platform, which means all of the parts are able to interoperate. And this is something that blockchain technology hasn't yet had. We've got many blockchains, and some of them even do some useful things other than transfer of uh, value. Uh, name coin for, but these things are very difficult to interoperate. Normally, you have to go through a third party. The third party is centralized, which means you have to trust them, and that defeats the whole point. With Ethereum, it's entirely interoperable. So we already have protocols like ICAP, right, which allow um, institution-level trustless ability to denote client accounts. So this is what this is basically what the banking infrastructure does, right? The IBAN protocol is a way for banks, in order to reference each other, and for you to know that your address is definitely going to this particular bank. Well, we have that, but it's decentralized. KYC and AML systems are very easy to, to, to imagine on top of this, uh, this uh, system. And of course, then you've got uh, decentralized reputation. Again, George mentioned, what about a passport? What if we had a passport? Passport to allow you to take your reputation between systems. Well, this interoperability, that's what Ethereum provides. You might say it enables Uber without Uber Inc. eBay without eBay Inc. Airbnb without the fundamental centralized company behind it. And this, this is something that hasn't really been experimented with before. We're not used to this notion. The notion that there can be a system that is complex, that allows us to interact with each other without a specific legal authority or entity behind it. This is very, very odd. And there are gonna be some very strange changes to society because of this. What I've called it, bizarre services. What it means, well, Think of it as an inclusive, anyone can take part on an equal level, globalized, it's based on the internet. Village, we've got reputation systems, we know who we're dealing with, bizarre, we can deal whatever we want to deal. It's a trading place, a marketplace. Are there any questions? Yeah. Hello, thank you very much, that was, that was great. Um, I thought this was gonna get technical when you stood up, but thanks for saving that for tomorrow. Um, you mentioned in your last slide com uh, ideas without companies behind them. Um, probably a question you get asked a lot. Who would build and support and maintain those systems without the profit motive behind? Yeah, this is this is, um, this is a great question. And one that I actually why, wanted to why answer. Why you build BitTorrent? Because it allows democratic ways of sharing files and things. But what, what is your kind of answer? Um, my answer is, um, why does anyone contribute to open source software? So back in the early 90s, there was like, well, no one's going to build, you know, an operating system that's open source. I mean, it, it takes IBM to do that, right? And then we have Linux. Why? Well, because there's a bunch of people with time on their hands that love to do it. Why do entrepreneurs go into business? Is it purely to make money? No, of course not. They want to make something that is of value to society, and they want it to succeed and live forever. They want to be remembered. Um, a bit of yeah. reputation. reputation, it helps them later on. But there's also just a notion of, yeah, I mean, I guess it's ego. It, it, it's, it's wanting to contribute to something bigger than oneself. And things like this, I, I, that this, I, I truly believe that um, this will follow precisely the same route as software. At the moment, people build software in a decentralized, almost voluntary fashion sometimes. And um, people will do the same for, for, for services and businesses and just ways of interoperating between people. So whereas once hackers hacked software, soon hackers will be hacking society. Question, you mentioned that uh, components within Ethereum will be interoperable. Mm. Uh, will you uh, communicate with other blockchains? Um, um, so... There, I mean, it depends on the blockchain, and it depends how much, um, how much people want to, to, how much interest there is. Uh, but for instance, with Bitcoin, we already have a project where we've been able to um, uh, trustlessly uh, transfer Bitcoins to Ether. So basically, the way it works is that there's a contract in Ethereum that is able to check that a particular number of transactions, uh, sorry, confirmations have happened on the Bitcoin blockchain, and if so, unlock coins uh, in Ethereum. So 
there's a, effectively you can sort of say you can put a beta and say provide me with a guarantee that you have sent bitcoins to this address and the the, the, the ether will be released. And can it go through the way around some ether? I think we'll need a bit of upgrading of the Bitcoin protocol to allow. Yeah. <laughs> so you're trusting a node in that case. You've got to trust the node. Ah, no. So what we trust is the proof of work and the uh, the state transition. So basically, you can provide a Merkle proof um, uh, that a particular amount of computational effort has been um, has been buttressing this particular computational proof that these coins have moved from this address. Um, well, moved from these addresses all the way through into this target address. And you can actually guarantee that that. So has it happened? Well, that's the computational proof, but you can guarantee that it's definitely um, semantically uh, valid. So you can guarantee that those currents did definitely exist. Of course, you know, has it has it actually happened? Well, that's why you did check that there's you know, 50 confirmations. It wasn't interesting. Of course, if someone could have massive network hash power, 50 percent attack, blah, blah, blah. But that's always the case. I'm curious as to how would you turn the device? Can it be like on a floating exchange? And since it's decentralized, then you face the same problem as Bitcoin, where there's no central monetary authority to control the pricing of the monetary policy. So, what is the thoughts? Um, so, ultimately, the Ethereum Foundation doesn't want to be in any way a controlling authority for nothing else than the legal reasons. But um, the price that Ether, Ether was sold at was simply picked largely out of the air. I mean, it, it ended up as being 1337 um, yeah. uh, Ether for Bitcoin, you know, uh, 1337. <laughs> 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 you know, it, it, it doesn't really matter because it's all, you know, it's all relative anyway. Um, now, the in terms of how it will be priced into the future, entirely not by market. So exactly the same thing as Bitcoin. It will be floating. We all have no control over it. So how many machines like out there are already mining just on the And would there ever be a case where like a critical application would use up power, more power that is available on the decentralized grid? Um, in theory it can happen. There's nothing in the protocol that doesn't stop it from happening, but there is a massive uh, sort of dam, if you like, that we've built, which is this notion of a gas limit or block. And what this does is it limits uh, by via the protocol, the amount of computation or storage that is required, um, uh, uh, that is that can total uh, within a block. So at the moment, it's uh, three uh, three million one hundred and forty one thousand five hundred and twenty seven, I believe, uh, which is pi times the <coughs> uh, rounded. But, um, and going into the future, this limit can be raised, but it can be only raised by a particular amount each time. Miners basically get to choose whether to raise it or lower it, but they can't lower it beyond a, a certain amount, a certain minimum. Um, so in theory, they could keep raising it, and in the year 2025, it could be, it could be you know, 3 billion or 3 trillion or whatever, and maybe then it will be like too much for any node at the moment to process. But that said, um, by 2025, the technology will have increased enough that the, the, the chances are that compute, uh, compute power will keep going. So, practically speaking, uh, there's a limit, and it's part of the question. Kevin, hi. Uh, I, I, uh, I found the company Autonomous, which is here in Singapore, which is a share of peer to peer built on Ethereum. So, we just started with that. And so, I invited a lot of people to now, including some regulators, and they keep on throwing questions at me about the safety and the security. Where do you perceive that in the vulnerability if we do this you know, share peer to peer transfer of bazaar or whatever it may be on the field? What, what should we worry about? So I don't really see there being a single bazaar in the same way that there's sort of a single eBay. Um, I think it will be as much a, a, proto, like a software protocol as anything else. Um, whereby anyone is anyone who conforms to the way of saying, hey, I've got this thing to sell or I need this thing to buy, will uh, will just be able to take part just naturally as much as they can take part in the web by speaking HTTP. Um, in terms of regulation, it, it's an interesting one because um, how do you regulate Bitcoin? You of course regulate the inputs and the outputs, also known as like the exchanges. Um, as soon as people start doing cash transfers between themselves, it becomes practically impossible to regulate. Um, I think um, partly 
um, but there will be voluntary regulation. So the AML, uh, the KYC stuff, there will inevitably be a, a portion of the community, maybe a large portion, um, that uh, provides an indication in order that they can sort of be a, a full member, a full citizen of this. I think for most people they will. Um, inevitably, there'll be sort of a gray, a darker area where people don't provide uh, such identity. Maybe they, they, maybe they just don't like being tracked. And I think in, in much the same way, it will mimic real life right now, where there is cash that's very easy to sort of uh, avoid being, uh, being traced. And there will you know, be sort of MasterCard and bank transfers and all the rest of it. Right? But the question I get, sorry, is, is more on the, the Ethereum itself, right? Where people ask, for instance, how can you make sure that 10 years down the line this, this is still going to run? I mean, you know, who knows? Okay. Uh, how can you make sure the system is going to be maintained over time? It ties probably in with the value of ether itself. So, what, what should I say? How so, I answer? I'm going to do Sue and Vision. In uh, terms of specific. <laughs> <laughs> so, in terms of specific vulnerabilities, um, I see only really two. Okay. The first is. Are your wallets, are your private keys, are they actually private, are they secure? Now this applies to pretty much any system. Um, of course you can have, we have ways of ameliorating this, this problem, uh, multi-sig wallets, uh, brain, brain, uh, brain wallets, um, where effectively your password is the, is the master key, so you don't have to worry about being hacked. But you know, inevitably things like key loggers and ultimately looking over someone's shoulder as they're typing in the password, it's always going to be a problem. Um, maybe if we have I mean, biometric ID to help a bit, but probably it's, it's always going to be human factors. We're humans, there are always going to be factors. Um, the second issue is something more um, sort of economic, an economic attack. So someone who buys an awful lot of compute power or high, hires a lot of the existing compute power to attack the network, cause a change of version and stuff. For this, it's really about um, a, a proper economic um, judgment over the risk. So if it's a large cash, if it's a large transfer that's happening on the network, you wait more than one confirmation before you sort of accept the uh, the transaction as being done. Um, I think as time goes time goes forward and there's much more interoperation with real life assets, real life assets that ownership is stored on the chain, then we'll have much less of a problem because of course everything's on the chain. So if one aspect of the deal gets reverted, the other aspect does as well. Everything's atomic. Of course, yeah. When when that's not the case, then there, there has to be judgment involved in, uh, in doing this. But that's the same with with all manners of business. So, you know, it's uh, it's all about judgment of risk. So I think there's there's going to be some um, some business in consulting on <laughs> precisely what risk is is valid for. for this. Um, those are the two that I, I think are most important in terms of well, who do I sue when things go wrong? <laughs> Um, get insurance. <laughs> you know, insur insurance firms will very soon, I mean, I know it's already starting with Bitcoin, this is going to be the case with blockchain, and they will look into the technicals and they will say, right, you need to pay us X amount per year to have X amount per year, because they will understand that that's, that's the correct risk factor. There are professionals who will do this and provide this service. Okay. Um, so when we come to the decentralized model, is that the point that everyone has access to the data? Like now everyone will know uh, what I project from today. Um, right, so um, pretty much in exactly the same way it's going to work with decentralized model. Because actually eBay almost is decentralized. It's decentralized except for this big fat guy sitting in the middle of everybody, taking 10% of all of the all of the transactions that are going between people. Um, all we're doing is saying, right, the logic that's on your servers that, that sets up that system, we're just going to decentralize that as well, in the same way that we decentralized FT FTP by providing BitTorrent. So how will it work? The interface will be almost exactly the same. Um, you will, When you look at eBay and you say, right, this guy I don't know, has got a reputation of 62, is this 62 clones of himself? You look at it, you check their transactions, you see that their transactions are from people of reputation 50,000, you go, right. Probably this guy is legit. We'll probably have automated systems to do this in the end anyway, sort of transitive um, uh, reputation calculation. So ultimately, the interface will look very similar in much the same way that the Amazon marketplace looks, the interface looks very similar to the straight Amazon interface. But, um, can't you just look on a blockchain and see uh, what people purchase? 
I would remove just from that, but yes. <laughs> you can indeed look on the blockchain and check. Yeah, so encryption, uh, encryption <coughs> is generally not something that can be used on the blockchain until we get homomorphic encryption, which probably won't be for a while yet. Um, storing information. So, yeah, uh, well, and computation. Um, so, yes, you will be able to check which transactions uh, have already done. Now, this needs to be gauged because maybe the transactions were fake and stuff, and it's uh, there needs to be sort of specific economic um, uh, evaluation and judgment behind um, the reputation decision, but it's tractable. It's a problem that we know how to solve. We're just solving it in a with an open computer rather than a, a private server. My question is about the privacy point because now everyone knows what I am, what I am doing, what I buy from. Oh, uh, I see. Um, so, sure. Um, this is a, an interesting question. It's, so there are two levels to privacy. The first is, um, do you need to be strictly anonymous or is pseudonymous okay? So in Bitcoin, you're not strictly anonymous. You're pseudonymous, right? You can have an, any number of an account, but any number of accounts, but each account is very much tractable. It's all recorded on the blockchain. Now, most people consider them to be basically the same. And when, when you bring into things uh, into the account things like tumbling services that effectively allow you to mostly anonymize uh, things between uh, accounts, then actually more or less is the same. In, in practical terms, it is the same. Um, on the other hand, of course, you might want to, co to consolidate accounts into a single account. You might want to have your eBay reputation actually linked and traceable to your Amazon Marketplace reputation, to your Facebook reputation. You might want that, you might not, but you'd be free to choose. And that's the idea. There's a, there's a notion of choice. So I have that option. So Ethereum doesn't, it's not a, it's not a sort of end user system. It doesn't sort of build it in. But what it does is it provides the means, the platform to allow um, other people, the next Linus Torvalds or whatever, to be able to build systems that do allow that. But statistically, you can't hide the statistics of, you know, the I guess you could change the name of the product. Or something. Everyone will know there were 500 widgets sold on this day and 400 sold the previous day. Sure. Uh, for, for people who sell such a large amount of widgets, I mean, if eBay is anything to go off, they really don't mind giving out that information. And if it's me, and I don't want to know people, uh, other people to know that I bought 500 widgets, <laughs> I make 500 different accounts, and each individual account buys a widget. So I, I'm, I'm just going to say I've never seen Kevin's presentation, but the one that I'm giving away, the kind of top end tales, he talks about the, the machine I talked about before. I, I think to your first question, and maybe it's to everyone, whether we'll get to that tipping point, is maybe people will start realizing that, uh, let's say, if I sell my music or put stuff up there uh, or buy stuff and the uh, Apple takes 70% and I take the third, uh, or Apple takes 30% and I take 70%, maybe that's not an equitable model. And once people start realizing that, because the problem now is we have this pseudo uh, participation economy, uh, hey, we all participate. But the, the, it's a 20th, 20th century green model, the money still goes up to just a very few. So until people start realizing that, hey, you know, maybe I, I take 40%, then I distribute 60% out. Then becomes a bit more equitable. I think that's pretty important. When we don't. So uh, and eventually it will be um, it will be the, the 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 matchmaker actually will take zero percent because the matchmaking will just be a commodity. Yeah. And who will take the uh, the two percent or the one percent that the, uh, the the buyer uh, the seller doesn't take? Well, they will be the people that provide the important services, maybe the um, uh, the escrow service. So the person that, that or the insurance service, the person that puts up the um, um, the the thing that allows the two people to trust each other that the good will indeed arrive. That's that's uh, that's where the. Uh... Sorry, how did that again touch on the first? The, the last sorry. question. Okay, sorry. Thank you. Um, my question is very simple. Mm. Um, let's say I love doing this, right? How do I make money doing what I love, considering that you're taking away my dog? I work for Uber. Yeah, absolutely right. Yeah, this, this is another interesting one. How does Linus make money doing what he loves? He's the first one. Donations, consulting. 
Um, sure. I mean, he uses the knowledge, right? He uses the thing that um, is not reproducible. Software is reproducible. So, you know, idealistically speaking, we shouldn't be able to charge for it because it doesn't cost anything, right? The, the cost of duplicating a piece of software is close to zero, right? What matters is the knowledge behind the software the understanding of how the software relates to everything else and how it might improve in the future. And Does this is worth- no jobs in the future? It's just one product or another? Depends. Do you consider Uber drivers to have jobs? Maybe it's many jobs. Maybe it's better jobs, more advanced jobs. <laughs> <laughs> but it's definitely an open question. Cool, thank you. So I'm um, Anthony Fermier, uh, CTO of Digitalogo. I pretty much uh, I've been building um, Digitalogo platform since 2000, early late uh, 2014. So uh, before we were just trying to do basically doing gold sales uh, using bitcoins um, in Singapore, and then we decided that we can build something better. Um, by providing a way to digitize gold assets and do um, a new, uh, you know, decentralized currency, so to speak, a decentralized token, where you can take these, uh, you can take gold and uh, basically store it with uh, a partner uh, custodian that's audited by a partner, um, a partner auditor, and is. Um, sold through our uh, partner channels so that to make sure to make sure that um, we guarantee that the gold that you're purchasing is a lbma certified gold bullion um, so these three signatures allow us to issue allow you to issue your own digital vouchers that can be divided um, the way you want it so let's say you bought a uh, one gram or one uh, hundred kilo uh, one kilogram gold bar Divided, you can divide it into a thousand vouchers, which means that it, each uh, each voucher is worth a gram. And we provide you with a customized wallet, which basically tells you exactly how much gold in weight you get. So even if you have uh, a divided, like you know, let's say you have uh, a voucher, you know, like ten vouchers that are um, 0.5 grams, and then you have twenty that are, um, you know one gram each, then we can, you know, we provide you with a, a wallet that shows you exactly how much gold you have. Um, we also have contracts that allow you to um, redeem the, the, this gold. So uh, an example would be, let's say you have, um, you know, a total of like 20 grams, right? And you wanted to get physical gold. Um, we have a contract that allows you to take, um, you know, uh, send, um, a certain amount of gold, let's say uh, you wanted to get a five gram uh, bar, you send this bar, or you send like, um, you know, you send, we, we create a contract that has an address that you send, uh, you know, five grams worth of uh, vouchers, and then you get a physical gold in your own personal vault um, as a contract as well. So the vaults are contracts and the, the um, actual vouchers are also contracts. Um, we allow you to create other contracts on top of our platform. So let's say you want to create your own company that you, and you want to have gold holdings for that company or even a decentralized organization that has its own gold holdings. Then you can create um, a Digix uh, issuance um, either as a voucher or as a straight uh, contract that basically releases a certain amount of gold to that organization or to that contract that you know you can set your own rules of how you want that uh, distributed or how you want that kept. So it's a tri-party agreement, like you said. Uh, Malka Mitt is our current custodian. They're similar to um, what is it called, Brinks. They, they also do deliveries and storage of, of um, assets. Um, Value Max is our uh, supplier, um, and Bureau Veritas Inspectorate in Singapore is doing the audits, which will provide signatures on. Um, the certificate, uh, sort of we're creating a certificate that that, um, that you can trace each um, token that you, you get can be traced to, to who is the auditor, who is the um, who is the custodian and who is the um, supplier of that gold. So you can always trace it back to, to the physical, you know, to who, who issued it. So there's a reputation system on top of this as well. 
So let's say the auditor starts cheating, then you can see that which which uh, vouchers are now sort of tainted, like a, a gray, until they make good on their original promise. Then you, you know the rating on that voucher can change, right? Um, So why are we trying to digitize assets? Um, well, um, you know, the Internet of Things, um, all these, uh, this, these new ideas, new, new ways of like uh, decentralizing, we need to make sure that there's value behind these applications that are being created. Um, there's, you know, the, like these new uh, applications or new app coins that are created um, can, uh, uh, will never go to zero in price. So let's say you can create your own issuance of your own personal uh, tokens, right? Um, you can back them with gold so that, you know, people will trust that more because now it's backed by Digix vouchers that will have gold behind them. So they will never, the price of your, your, your tokens will never go to zero, right? Um, you can do it for crowd sales. So let's say you're doing the crowdfunding for a new product. You can, instead of using Bitcoins or like some other currency, you can use Digix vouchers as your underlying asset. So you know that you, you can you can tell uh, you can basically put the gold standard back into crowdfunding. Essentially, what we're trying to do. Um, so you know, like all these other assets are not fungible. So we're trying to provide fungibility to your assets so you can convert them back to other things. Um, and the other assets that we're going to try to digitize are. Um, commodities, um, property, physical property, um, you know, using the same protocol, you can have, um, you know, people like uh, participants in your supply chain as part of the whole proof of asset protocol, right? So, so they can sign on to that certificate, that underlying certificate of that asset, right? So you can um, have decentralized, sort of like a, a bazaar, like the village bazaar model to creating new um, digitized assets. So eventually you'll have, um, you know, uh, auditors, um, for example, um, in, a, in a carbon trading platform, you can, you'll have uh, verifiers, which, you know, in, in the carbon trading world, there's, you got to verify that your project, like for example, your tree planting project is, um, you know, is part of the standards that, you know, you are actually planting a certain number of trees. So you have an auditor, and they sign on the blockchain saying that yes, this company is uh, has a project of you know ten thousand trees that equal to one, um, car, uh, you know twenty carbon emission credits, and they sign that, and then you can then use that certification to create other you know to, to go to the next part of the chain. So for example, you want to create your own um, create your own carbon token, right? A carbon token, then the, because it's part of that chain, then you. Um, you can trust that it's it's going through the whole supply chain of, of being like you know being verified, being audited properly, um, and then when you uh, want to make sure that you sell, sell it back to somebody else, that you know that like the the uh, the person buying that token um, can see where you know like how how that token came about, right? So there's national product in China, or you know it's uh, it's by this company, right? So you can trace you can trace that back to the original source. Uh, through the reputation Right, so our launch plan is basically, uh, people have asked us this, is when are we launching? Well, obviously we can't launch until Ethereum is launched. Uh, <laughs> that's for you guys. Um, and we are launching when uh, Homestead is out because uh, uh, it's because Homestead, they're re resetting the, the, uh, the state. So any transactions um, that involve Digix vouchers will get reset and it's going to be a nightmare for us to manage that. Um, in Frontier, so we're going to wait until it's stable and we make sure that the transactions can't be reversed at that point. So we're waiting for that. 
Um, but right now you can um, actually, I don't know if we launch it, but we're planning on launching the gold sales. So you can actually um, buy the gold and create the vault contracts. So you, you'll have that and then we'll, we'll uh, port that, we'll migrate, migrate the data over into the Homestead blockchain. That's available. <laughs> Uh, questions? Uh, what, what you're doing is, is obviously already being done by, by a gold feature. It's the same thing on a specific mm -hmm. bar. And so, so I'm trying to understand um, what, what, where the power of Ethereum comes in. Is, am I correct in saying that when you use a, a, a very fast as the um, certification agent and you use the custody agent and so on, then are they part of the multi-sig on the blockchain? Or are they they're, they're signing a certificate. So like the, the way that our issuance contract um, works is that it requires signatures from two, uh, three different entities, right? Sure. And and um, we also have a, uh, the auditor is a separate requirement on that, that it has to actually sign the audits every month, right? So the audits require, like will happen every month. So there's a monthly but guarantee. this is still happening in the analog world. Presumably. Right, so there's that, yeah, exactly. So, so the reputation system is the most important part of this, right? So to make sure that Malka is playing fairly, that they're not, you know, keeping the rule for themselves and- Sure, uh, but that's, that's the same as the future right. as well, right? That's, 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 yep. that's absolutely. Right. So, the, so blockchain doesn't come in there. I understand it comes in with the transfer mechanism right. as the ledger for transferring those certificates. Mm -hmm. So my last question is then perhaps, um, the actual certificate is sort of a dematerialization of, of what is now a, a, a certificate with a specific claim on a specific gold bar in Zurich with yeah. this number. So are you coding that certificate? Is that, does that, yeah. is that a smart contract? It's going to be a contract, yes. So anybody can see it now. Um, and it can't be forged. Um, you know, it has our, ultimately, it has our signature on top of what the certificate um, chain. It's sort of like the way SSL works, right? You have a CA of issuing your certificates to a company, right. and that CA is responsible for making sure that, like this company is who they say they are. Um, so they do their due diligence. When you create an SSL certificate, you provide your information. Um, if you get an ED SSL, you have to provide your business, um, you know, like your business registration info to them and all that stuff, right? So that's where we're doing. It's like we're creating platforms for these participants to get certified by us to be able to create these certificates to digitize assets and so on and so forth. Okay. Any questions? Um, yeah, I've got two questions. Um, sure. Firstly, where would someone go to audit the smart contracts? Um, and second one is, do you think this is a better proposition at the moment than, say, stable coin linked to the Yeah. Okay. So, um, the first one is where do you, uh, where do people go to audit our contracts? Yeah, so see, make sure they behave in the way you describe. Right. So um, we're publishing our so we're, um, two things to that. We are also creating a uh, because we have a um, we have a the, the system allows uh, we're, we're, our, the idea is for us to interoperate or allow other people to interoperate with our platform, right? So we're creating a, uh, a, a contract certification um, contract. So you can basically publish your um, the, the plain text um, to your solidity code and we compile and we compare that to the address of the contract that's residing in the blockchain. And we say that, yes, this is exactly the same code that you're seeing here, right? So we have, um, so, so our IO contract, we basically, um, we have this, this contract called IO, which basically allows you to create your own um, apps to inter interact with the digits holdings that you have. Um, and we certify the contracts that you create so that when you execute your contracts, you know that it's actually being executed the way that you expect it to be executed, right? But you're not changing the code behind you. Um, if there is a change in the code, like for example, we have like, um, uh, in, in Ethereum, you have like, you know, contracts calling other contracts. How do you know that that contract that you executed is calling the right contract that you know that it's going to get called? So we, you know, that there's a chain of certificates, right? That you can make sure that, you know, that's exactly being executed the way um, it's, it's executed. And the second one is why uh, stablecoin? Why not? Uh, why yeah. not peg it to? Um, I think there's two. There are two different approaches, right? Um, so uh, one. Um, 
so you can you can peg it to the price of gold, right? And you can use uh, Augur as your um, prediction market to say that yes, the price of gold is this price, right? Um, what we're doing is um, slightly different from that. We're basically allowing you to either create just a straight voucher, one to one, non fractional, um, you know, gold standard type of token that you can use. Or you can create your own stable coin using, you know, using the vouchers to make your 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 assets stable. Right? Um, so I think there's two different approaches to that. Um, I think people would see that you know having something access to actual physical things, physical gold would be you know beneficial to some use cases, some some not. Yes. Um, so. It's really cool that you guys are obviously you know, starting with gold, starting small, and they're looking to, to branch out to mm -hmm. you know, once like paintings, the diamonds, right. sort of any many other sort of assets, and obviously uh, uh, carbon tokens as well, and carbon credits. But what are some of the other long term plans for Digital Global? I mean, obviously, it's like a hell of a lot of scope. Uh, yeah. You've got a big, big team ready to go. So, what's the sort of the future potential for Digital Global? Like, where's this going? Right. So, uh, when, we, when, when I started like sort of building the jigs, um, I realized that, like, you know, I, I started abstracting the code, you know, like to make sure it's like modular. And I realized that like all these things can be used to build other asset tokenization platforms. So eventually what we want to do is basically, you know, um, have other companies reach out to us and work with us either on a consulting basis or we provide a solution to um, digitize like their assets. Uh, one example is we're talking to, talking to a carbon trading um, in Europe. Uh, they're trying to create a decentralized carbon platform um, to allow carbon trading to become more global so people can participate um, just by having carbon projects or being a corporation that wants to invest in carbon offsets. Um, you know, so, um, the other thing we want to do is um, auctions. Um, you, know, uh, you can have, um, let's say, uh, in eBay, right? You, um, for me to be able to participate in eBay, I have to have a reputation. Um, let's say I, you know, like my uh, my uncle died and he gave me this Rolex watch and I want to sell it. Like I either have to sell it to a company that you know that has a, uh, you know a reputation in eBay to sell it, or um, what I can do with with um, asset tokenization is you can have like these companies providing uh, as a participant they can provide um, custodial uh, services. So for example, um, you know. Um, a company can then take your your items, you know, like your Rolex watch. They hold it in custody, and they issue um, they issue a, a message on the block um, on this on our certificate chain, and then we issue you um, we issue you a digital certificate that you can trade on a you know anywhere, and you can send that, and whoever owns that can can redeem the asset. So, so effectively, the asset itself is already in a scroll. Yeah. Um, Okay. So the escrow, the escrow is basically a participant mm -hmm. that is allowed to sign, and they have a reputation system to make sure that they play fairly. Sure. Right. So as long as say the watch is at the, with yeah. the escrow with, with the vault, yeah. there's no way that people can sort of yeah. screw you over. And you same. can add, you can also add, um, you can also add um, appraisal, right? So you know when you put a product in, you can have it appraised, and the appraisal signs saying that yes, it's appraised at this value, and there's like no scratches, right. and it's correct. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's the, there's that that's chain, and you, you get like trust. You know, as long as reputation increases, then, um, awesome. um, what do users have to trust in, in, the, in the system? What? What do users have to trust when when they trade for gold in the system? Um, we have fees to so to buy the gold. We have fees, obviously. Yeah, uh, trust. Chart? Trust. The, the trust. 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 Yeah, so you got to trust um, because we it's a tri-party agreement, you you know, and these companies that we're working with are already established companies. Um, you know, people already trust Malka Mit. Um, companies already trust Inspectorate as auditors. They, they have, you know, years of experience doing auditing gold um, for, you know, brick and mortar companies that are existing companies. They do that already. They also do commodities auditing. Um, Valley Max is a trusted um, dealer. Uh, you know they sell gold, um, and they're an LBMA. Uh, you know the gold they sell is LBMA certified. So you don't have to trust us. You trust these participants, right? I guess it's all reported on the blockchain as well. Yeah, so if absolutely. Agree. And you can see the history of, of their reputation that you know that these guys, you know, over time, their reputation will increase. 
I guess the, you see that their history of playing fairly is there, then, you know, it, it, and they can carry that reputation over um, to other things that they want to do as a service, right? So Mako can benefit from, you know, like the reputation working with us to offer other um, custodial services for other things, right? And they can use that same um, um, signature to, to sign for other things as well. Uh, I think that the result for each is still more segment. Yeah, let's thank them. Yeah. Great. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thanks again, also from from my side for for organizing um, this and having us here. So um, yeah, I I wear kind of two hats. So I work. I'm involved with Ethereum um, as well, uh, managing the security <coughs> audit prior to launch, but. Now, kind of this evening, I'm talking about another project called Provenance, which is a social startup based in um, London that I co-founded with my business partner, Jesse Baker, um, and which has the mission to bring more transparency to supply chains. So that's why we started, or where she started basically about two years ago and where I joined about a year ago at the same time when I came across Ethereum. So yeah, what's, um, what's wrong with uh, supply chains? Or, or why, why do we do that? So there's increasing consumer demand like for, for knowing more about the origin of products. I mean, that might be for clothes. So um, was my jeans actually like organic cotton or for food? Um, that, that's what people ask. But more importantly, um, actually supply chains are pretty, pretty bad. Like um, the, the state is that like there's lots of crimes happening. There are really awful working conditions. So that's a photo from the factory collapse in, uh, in Bangladesh um, about two years ago. So like really awful things happen. And, and as consumers, we basically, um, every day we buy something, we take kind of a political decision, maybe the most important political decision by supporting this system or another system, but we don't have a mechanism or a system in place to inform these decisions in a good way. Um, so yeah, how, I mean, people have tried to to kind of come up with, with solutions to that problem. So they resorted to certification, but effectively, what's green, what's organic, what's fair trade, what's behind that? And can we be sure that um, a certificate that was um, issued with a producer um, was not um, faked? And so we get kind of a double spending, um, get a, a product that was actually not fair, tra fair trade or organic in the first place. So the essence is basically... Um, Right now, like no centralized system or no approach that we have so far could make supply chains more transparent. So um, um, efforts are really fragmented. Um, uh, people try um, to build platforms, like there are some uh, certification agencies, for example, in Wood, that try to come up with a trading um, platform for for certificates for Wood. Um, but effectively, uh, the producers and manufacturers don't buy into that system because they are afraid of whether their person, their private state, their data, their business, um, uh, their critical business information is secure, um, and things like that. So there's right now kind of no way for for having um, for having more transparency. So um, provenance, as I said, initially was founded two years ago um, with the mission of building tools, open tools that enable good good producers, good manufacturers to talk about the processes behind their products. So um, kind of uh, building frameworks for documenting how things are made in their, um, in their workshops um, so that the actual unique selling point is the real story and not just merely marketing. But then, uh, like last year, we came across Ethereum um, and realized that there might be more potential for, for building this on a decentralized system um, in order to track the entire chain of custody. So, um, I mean, similar to, to what you presented, um, um, just prior um, as the Dix Global, like tracking the entire asset, making sure um, sure we know um, about the entire origin. So um, what it hinges on is having an identity in the first place on that system. So there must be some mechanism how an asset is issued or comes into that um, digital marketplace in the first place. So certifiers would give identities to, to producers like a coffee farmer in Ecuador so they can um, they at the same time get the, the right for creating a certain number of, of tokens that represent their coffee. Um, 
And in addition, like we have smart contracts that represent the business logic. So how get how does coffee get transformed into um, grain coffee or into uh, roasted coffee? So we can be sure that what we eventually get um, had an origin um, in the first place. So um, so yeah, maybe just to give you an idea like how things could work. So a farmer initially, as I said, gets a certificate for for um, whenever they farm farm coffee, they uh, they put that on the blockchain. There's a certification mechanism similar to Digit Global's mechanism. Um, then further onwards, that token that was created could be um, could be traded. Um, maybe you add um, genetic information, um, shard and encrypted on that um, uh, or uh, signed on that um, to that token, so you can verify actually that what you trade digitally is related to the physical asset you receive. Um, so eventually that when you buy in the shop, you can use your smartphone um, and see the whole history that's behind the product. So yeah, so that's that's kind of um, uh, where we are as provenance. So we are establishing partnerships with certifiers to, to deploy and, and develop such a system, a proof of concept um, to show that such a mechanism um, can work. And then um, relating back to what Gav said, I guess um, the most powerful aspect of, of this system is um, that it's an open system, so um, in the long run, this could, could become a, a really open marketplace where you have kind of um, peer or crowd certification or workers and farms could add information to that system, verify that actually they work under good conditions or receive their, their wages in a timely manner. Um, so, yeah, that's also basically the reason why we decided to use Ethereum. So um, it's a really versatile system, allows to implement whatever business logic you like, um, and also in particular, um, allows other people to add um, and, and build on that system um, to, to add more value. understood your question correctly but so so what are some of the examples that people will use this for uh, so a coffee i cannot check economically value right now that is genetically the same coffee that i was digitalizing that i physically bought right from origin to now and, uh, and it is uh, the, in, in the origin of coffee it's infinitely available right it's not like i can there's a finite amount of time there's a finite amount of time. Hmm. so uh, in what so, cases are you thinking that people will check and check the authenticity economically value? So I mean, for, like in general, um, at the state where Ethereum is, like um, some things won't be economically viable because the transaction cost might be too high. Like actually, um, um, kind of going back and seeing the entire, like the full detailed origin of just one liter of, of milk might be might be too too fine grains to, to track. Uh, more on a higher level that might be possible, like one one thousand liter or something of milk, um, and and then I mean initially it, it all hinges on having a mechanism how to how to measure how much um, coffee or cotton or whatever was digitized in the first place. So that's why we're also working with certifiers because they have these processes in place. They already issue certificates for a certain amount of of um, of cotton. So, um, but coming back to your question, maybe, um, I guess like it's, it's right now it's probably high value consumer goods like clothes or um, bags or stuff like that. Um, but then in the long run, I guess that this could extend to, to even more, um, many more cheaper pro products. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes, and obviously like the scope for prominence is massive. Typically mm. any product that is bought and sold today could be represented on, on the chain, but um, there's probably 
one thing or a couple of things that you know it adopts this system really really quickly and that's what's going to bring provenance to prominence mm. uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, what, what, what sort of product do you think that will be uh, do you think it would be coffee or do you think it would be some sort of uh, i mean what, what's going to be the the, you know, the the main sort of use case for this straight away well, who's going to pick this up first um like I think that there are several things where I could see that being adopted um, relatively early. So first of all, small companies that right now probably have um, a relatively good transparency or know where this stuff comes from, but do not have a platform for conveying this to customers, like to makers, manufacturers, they want to document and add more authenticity. Um, so they gain a big um, value from such a system because they can um, sell their products um, more expensively. Um, consumers are, are willing to pay about 20% more for products with origin, so that's what studies show. Um, otherwise, I guess more simple supply chains like wood um, could, could do well because there's already certification mechanisms in place, processes in place. If you ask me what I would want to see, it's probably close because it's like a really massive problem um, on, on many ends, like be it how cotton is, is farmed in the first place or the condition in sweatshops, and it's a huge market. So. So how would one look up, like let's say, yeah, for example, clothes, right, and mm -hmm. shopping? Um, how would like what would be the workflow for me? Like I'm shopping in clothes and I see a brand. How do I check through Providence that it's fair trade? Is there a barcode or? I, yeah, that could be like a very very um, low cost um, uh -huh. way to kind of uh, link the physical product to the blockchain. Just a barcode. Um, which, for, which when I scan it, also I gain, um, I can claim ownership. So like with Bitcoin wallets, where you get, um, where you can then um, retain the ownership of, of um, claim the ownership of the Bitcoin. Yeah. yeah. I mean, in the long run, it could also be um, smart tags um, that allow you to, to do more complex things. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's great, really great. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling a little bit with the link between the physical asset and the, 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 the smart contract. Mm -hmm. um, isn't this ultimately going to be an Internet of Things play where you're going to see tagging of, for instance, components that go into certain things? Um, it is an Internet of Things um, um, kind of platform for dumb stuff. Um, I fully, I fully agree. Um, so, and you need to make some some link. So, um, in addition to just the tags that you could kind of add to close, I would see. I mean, genetic information um, as an important um, way to, to fingerprint. So it's already employed to detect fraud in supply chains, and it's becoming ever cheaper to do genetic verification. So that would give you kind of a, a really cheap way to, to make sure that the wood you get is actually the wood that was sourced in the first place. You could just take a sample and, and, and scan it. But now in the absence of safe tagging, uh, you know, some uh, you know, things that are not Sensor, you, you, you're relying on certification sensors. Yeah, but the way, so the way how, how this makes things simpler is or compared to how the certification system right now works. So what they do is not only do they certify the producer, but they certify every single person in the supply chain. So they check whether they are able to do their counting in the right way, whether they are able to keep things separate. And this is a really costly process, yet they can't be sure that um, the, Within a transaction between two companies, stuff is made up, so there's no way to check that. And this is basically something that, that would kind of um, allow you to, to erase that possibility of fraud entirely. And also the need for doing this certification all the time for the for the supply chain further down, further downstream. Basically, as soon as you have a proper process for, for the creation, um, the rest is kind of um, much more easier to handle. How you certify today? Um, when you give expensive back, it's, it's still the same chain, just that it's cheaper and it's on the blockchain. Because if a company, let's say, goes through this and maybe they're able to do fraud in the fee somehow for a couple of years, they're not selling stuff out there, you're not going to get return on my shirt, right? I mean, I've been wearing the fraud shirt certified for a couple of years, I'm not going to get my money back. Oh, you're not going to get your money back, but like the reputation of a company that does this repeatedly will go down. I mean, many of these systems then. It's the same today as well. Just that their certification is much more expensive. 
are much more expensive and, and kind of more difficult to, to verify also. I mean, even if I buy like an FSC certified um, table today, like, okay, I can go back and see, yeah, uh, kind of it, it shows, this label shows it came from that factory, but how do I make sure that it actually did or that it's just, just like printed on that label? Yeah. Uh, how is problems funded? Um, so initially, we got some seed um, seed funding for building this this uh, framework, this more centralized application that we came up. Um, we were um, really lucky to get um, additional funding from the European Union and the UK government to build this proof of concept. So we applied explicitly for building a decentralized application, and they um, granted us money to do that. So that's what we are basically doing together with certifiers um, throughout this year. Okay, hi. Hi, hi everyone. Um, so, <clears throat> I thought the presentation today had been a lot about technology, so I was going to do about people. So, we talked until. Uh, my background was uh, in advertising. I was the former, former chief creative officer and the vice chairman for Publicis in Asia. Uh, and I've left to venture and do different things. So. Uh, so my job primarily had to come up with ideas and then observe and understand people in the marketplace. So today's talk is about people 3.0. So we live in exponential time. So we start with an assumption. Do we all agree we live in exponential times? Maybe you say no, then maybe the assumption doesn't work. But let's start here. We live in exponential time. So what caused it? All of you know what caused it. Moore's law, doubling of computing power every 18 months of... Uh, 20, 30 years, um, unprecedented financial liquidity. I gave this similar version of this yesterday at the next bank conference for bankers. So when I said unprecedented financial liquidity, because yeah, yeah. there's so much money floating around because people are printing it like it's going out of fashion. And obviously the internet. So I'll just quickly go through this. Increased productivity is a result of it, right? So exponential time. It's led to disruption, innovation, new industries, increased knowledge, awareness, and transparency. It also leads to exponential business change. So you might not see it, but this came from, uh, I've taken some of the slides from Kleiner Perkins. So look at the uh, global internet companies in 1995, 20 years ago. $16 billion was the total market cap. Look at where Apple is. It was worth $3.9 billion. Yeah, $4 billion. Look at 20 years from now. It's $2.5 trillion, $2.4 trillion. Look at Apple. Apple's worth $763 billion. So we're talking about exponential business growth in 20 years. All right? Okay. In a year, let's just talk about a year. Okay, this just came out. This is Samsung's market share in China alone. Uh, last year, look at that. Apple's market share was 8.7% and Samsung was 20%. Okay, Within one year, Samsung dropped to 9.7% and uh, Apple rose to 14.7%, so almost 15%. So that one year has an exponential business effect. The reality is the pace of change will be faster. This comes from Forbes 1000 list, right? So if you look at it, 73 to 83, 10 years, 35% of the companies would have new, new companies would have come in. Basically, that's what it's saying. So from 2003 to 2013, within that 10 years, out of 1,000 companies, 70% are new. So you're looking at exponential change from a business and industry perspective. But the, you know, we we're very good at talking about uh, technology and, and business and all. We forget that this has an effect on the mind. So is there an exponential change up here? We never think about it because human beings are conditioned to think linearly. We don't think exponentially. So when I I have a twelve year old son, do I think he's exponentially smarter than I am? Can I go? Yeah, when I was 12, I was this, so you'll be this. I'll just give you a personal example. When I was 12, I was reading Mad Magazine and Beano, right? And he came back to me yesterday with a English composition. His first paragraph 
kind of talked about time, the concept of time. And he's, he ended up with this brilliant line. I thought it was brilliant. He said, we are all clocks merely waiting for it to ring. It was like existential. It was deep. Do <laughs> you know what I mean? We like, I was reading Beano, we're like, ah, you know. I was like, holy shit. So is that an exponential change in the mic? So the, the India hole in the wall experiment, if you don't know, was conducted in 1999. It's a famous uh, TED Talk thing. What he did was he actually had a computer that was uh, linked up to the internet and it was by the wall. So the Indian street kids could go and play with the computer. What they realize is in half an hour, or by the end of the day, the kids could point and click. Right? Give them a few months, they could speak English, they could email, you know, and the, the this test was replicated around the world. So lately there was one I think was done in Ethiopia in a remote village that has this computer and and uh, these kids who have never seen anything like that, within a few months they were emailing and, and talking to people in English. So that's the exponential change in the mind that marketeers are struggling with and governments are struggling with because the people are smarter, far quicker than ever before. So exponential change then therefore leads to consumer. This is a famous advertising quote from David Ogilvy. The consumer is not a moron, she's your wife. The exponential change in your wife now is that she now has an app that follows you around, has facial recognition software, <laughs> and cross-references your social media time. She probably had is your friend on Facebook under assumed name. <laughs> okay? And I tell brands you are no longer in charge of the brand because the consumer is. Just like you're not in charge of the marriage. Okay? Your wife is. <laughs> So there's exponential disruption. There's the democratization of invention, the uberfication of everything, as Gavin was talking about. So democratization of invention means anyone can invent anything now because the technology is so available. So this kid was 14. He said, I'm going to invent a pros prosthetic, no, develop a prosthetic arm. He's in the middle of, of the nowhere in Utah, and he does it uh, within five years, and it's a mind control prosthetic arm. I think he did it for under $10,000. And then last year at uh, South Point, or this year at South by Southwest, I think, he released it open source. So if you're a prosthetic arm manufacturer thinking like, oh, I've got all it, you're screwed. Because <laughs> it's up there. Uh, there's a home printing circuit board. So you, now you can print your circuit boards at home. So imagine you combine it with 3D printing and $25 of Arduino chips. What can you not make? What can you not invent? And then obviously there's this. Okay, there was Bitcoin and so all these things are happening. One of the things we we I, I was talking about, I I've used this for quite a few years, and I thought, oh, I was very smart. But then you know, Ray Kurzweil has been talking about this for a while. And the secret to forecasting success is exponential thinking. Not linear thinking, but exponential thinking. One of the examples he gave was um, when you're doing, when they were doing the DNA sequencing, genome sequencing project in 1990, they said it'll take 15 years to finish it. What they did factor in was that because of Moore's law, the computers become faster and processing speeds become faster. They finished it under 11 or 12 years. If you do anything now, you might estimate five years, I would advise you to half it. Okay? But the mind doesn't process it that way. Governments don't process it. When they implement a policy and they go, oh, it'll take 15 years to, for it to take effect, I would half it and then see what happens. So there are 21st century principles that consumers now kind of, whether they're here to or not, but they believe in and they live in it. Uh, there's obviously a clear vision of why. So companies can't just go, Oh, this is why I am, this is why I do. No, they want to know your reason for existence. Why? And you need to constantly adapt. There's no company that is now, this is why I am. The 20th century industrial age was, if I produce a cup, then I've figured out all the back end, the manufacturing, the distribution, you know, and I've done the cup. All you're making is the cup. These days, 
you have to adapt. This is the Darwinian principle of survival. You have to constantly be in beta stage. You might do a car, but you might have to do something else. So the Germans have come up with uh, computerized factory arms that are designed to do anything you want them to do. So you might use the arms to make cars one day, but when the car business goes, you might use the arms to make soy sauce. That's how flexible they are. So the adaptability bit needs to be there. So you're in constant beta. You need to empower people, whether you like it or not, you have to empower them. That, that talks to both your customer as well as your own people. So it's a management, could be a management uh, uh, philosophy as well. You need to allow people to participate, whether it's your people or the customer. You need to feel and to be transparent. So what do people 3.0 want? So people want to belong anywhere. So the uptake of Airbnb. So Airbnb is big. They're currently, I think they were in, they started in 2007, 2008. They currently, if you think of them in hotel terms, they're probably the biggest hotel around the world. They have so many homes. Um, but as Gavin was talking about it, that's the first. There will be others that will disrupt the disruptors. There will be other Airbnbs. We could create our own, right? Uh, Everyone wants to be, be, be less busy and work anywhere. So Slack is a project management system that's out there, Trello. There's so many of them out there. And, and as we talked about it, we're going to have many jobs. And we might do different things depending on the day or depending on the value of my skill. Maybe at 12 o'clock in the afternoon, uh, my marketing skills are in demand and they cost, so I'll work more of that. Okay? So these things are all coming to play. Uh, STEMC is a, a, a beta stage, but it allows you to now create beautiful, beautiful content. So every one of you could be a, almost like a magazine publisher. Okay, It's just a beta stage. If you go and check it out, it's beautiful. It's got fantastic, easy publishing tools that you can use. So what are the possibilities? So magazines could now, they could be the magazine stand for, every mag for, for any interest you want, because it's co-created and published by all of you guys. Uh, the big thing now is about craft, bespoke, and making things because we've over saturized on globalization. If you look at Singapore, why aren't people coming to Orchard Road to shop? Because we have the same shops everywhere else. <laughs> <laughs> you got the same Kelvin, uh, the Kelvin price is the same, you know, it's still made in China, but it's the same. So, and we're not cheap as well. So, why? So, now people are looking for deeper experiences, maybe more authentic experiences. And you'll see a rise in all, um, and craft bespoke. I mean, I'll, I'll give you a business example. Um, who's been to Orchard Central recently? You know, that, that ugly building that kind of, yeah, with no one going there. So I've got a friend, he runs this uh, a thing called uh, Nice. Nice is like a public gardens. They host and you rent a table and you sell your stuff. Orchard Central is so desperate for people. They're offering him, look, here's this atrium. I'll give you the space, free. I'm not even going to charge you. And he organizes and gets all these people who are making rings and their own craft come. So he charges them rent, but he has no cost because the shopping center has problem attracting people to come to shop. shop. So they have to rely on people creating stuff to bring you in. If I'm a tenant, then I'll be so pissed off, right? Because they're not coming to shop at my shop. They're just coming in to shop at, and buy the craft. And then the shopping mall goes, well, I've got 4,000 foot fall, you know, so it justifies my rent. So you see everything's being disrupted and the things are changing around. Uh, people want to make money outside of work. Again, this is from the same slide as the opportunity to make money off Airbnb, Etsy, Thumbtack, Uber. Well, Airbnb in um, 2009, uh, when the recession hit America, a lot of people lost their jobs. But a lot of people managed to keep their homes because Airbnb helped keep up some of the mortgage payments. Okay, think about it. You're living in Singapore, very expensive place. You buy an apartment for two, three hundred thousand dollars. You're going to work 30, 40 years to pay it off. You're going to be working 10, 12 hours. So you're not actually at home enjoying your apartment. Think about it. Okay, why not make it work for you? And a lot of people want it now. So uh, just in time, 
the product, the transportation, the food, the delivery, all these systems are coming up. And also, on top of that, the opportunity to disrupt all these systems. Okay. Uh, invent a new currency, that's possible. Uh, this was almost three years ago. So Nike created this uh, vending machine in the middle of uh, uh, in New York. And you could redeem the items in there, depending on how many round miles you've accumulated. So sweat becomes currency. Think about that. So I, I tried uh, to present this to Citibank. Citibank has city bikes in New York and most cities around. I think they clock around a million miles a month. But what if those miles could be currency? What if it was fungible? What if you could trade it for Amazon dollars? What if you can go to Starbucks and go, you know, uh, I ride 20 miles a week, they'll get me a cup of coffee. So, that's okay. so there's this whole new world that's coming up. What's stopping it? Obviously, uh, uh, companies that have invested in the infrastructure, so they're entrenched in it. And what's stopping it is also the minds of the marketers around. Okay? You could easily go to Singapore Airlines and say, my Chris Flyer miles, can I buy, can, I, can you make it fungible and then I trade it on Amazon or eBay or something, and then get something back. If you had your mouse, wouldn't you like to buy something else, <laughs> and not just buy a trip? Okay, so that gives you freedom. Uh, they like you to use uh, big data insights. This just came out earlier this week as well. Uh, the Swedish home company, in the homes, they go, let me look at the data from 2 million suites. What do they look for? What do they uh, pick? What, what are they you know, uh, interested in? And they found that uh, they all clicked on this notion of a, a log cabin and a barn, and then a sort of a layout. And red. So they created this, you know, a little bit of what you're looking for, but a little bit of what you never knew could have. So now they're selling this. You just put it on the market. So if you use data carefully from, from them and give them something in return, that's what they like. Um, they also like you to follow my energy. This is also, this is kind of a whole TED talk, but if you follow the 21st century principles, uh, it says here the first follow who transforms the first nut into a leader uh, is the one who legitimizes the first guy. So basically, this guy, he's in a concert and he's like, okay, there's always an idiot out there, right? You, you'll be sitting there, oh my God, he's an idiot and he's trying, he's dancing. But then there'll be the idiot will have a follower who will just join him. <laughs> and then the first guy will teach him, no, you can't do it like that. Okay, I'll do it. Right, so he's dancing. And then after all that guy, because this guy legitimizes the first guy, he calls in multiple people. So these are the early adopters. <laughs> so the early adopters. Ah. Then the rest of us sitting around go, yeah, actually now I'm being left now. I want to be cool. <laughs> yeah, you can, you know. That's how I'm looking at stuff. Okay? For brands, they all in the past wanted to be this guy. But in this day and age, the brands should be this guy. You're the first follower. Uh, big corporate policy changes that could be possible. I mean, uh, earlier this year, France just said all new buildings will have to have solar panels and green roofs. Done. Okay? New industry, everything was created. We're talking about the possibilities for Ethereum, for the grid and all. So France has done it. What if it goes around the world? Suddenly there's a whole new industry of possibilities. And what's, what's up with France? Not only that, earlier this week, they've, they've enacted a law that said all fresh food, unsold food that's still edible, you have to give it to charities. You can't throw it away anyway. The, the wastage for supermarket food is, is supremely high. It's up to 30% of food is wasted. It's just thrown away. So they're just making people more efficient. Okay? That might have applications with what you're doing. Uh, complete culture change. So I met Tony last year when I was doing a talk in um, uh, South by Southwest uh, Vegas on tech. And he was talking about how he's, he's been building um, downtown Vegas, the startup world. And then uh, earlier this year, he's going like, here's this new management staff. It's going to happen. Okay? And now he's telling his staff, you don't like it, 
here's a severance package. Thank you very much. So people are pushing, whether it's from the top or from the, the bottom, which is very rare from the top, but you know, he's one of those guys who will push it from the top. But this system is about evening things up. There's no managers. So everyone's in charge of their own thing and you're quite fluid and all. So it's a it's a it's a new disruptive management concept. Who knows whether it works or not, but it follows these principles that I laid out. And obviously, there's a huge opportunity in government. If you look at this, uh, this is uh, talking about WeChat and Tencent, just helping the government to get online. You, just within the Shanghai government services provided by WeChat, you can do your hospital, pay your gas, obtain Taiwan travel documentation, do a smog test because you know Shanghai is screwed up, right? Property tax loopholes, uh, look up, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> driving violations, passport, everything. So they're doing everything on WeChat. We're not doing anything on WeChat yet, huh? In Singapore, we're supposed to be so ahead. We're not that so ahead. These guys are way, 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 way ahead. Uh, brands are getting into that. Coca-Cola is doing foundry. Uh, Unilever is doing the, uh, the thing. Uh, GE has uh, the innovators as well. So what they're doing is, my brand stands for happiness. So what are the ideas and startup ideas that revolve around happiness? Let me amplify and magnify. So they're being the first follower. They're not being the crazy guy, they're being the second guy. Now. That's uh, the foundry from Unilever. Uh, and lastly, the growth potential for this is huge. Uh, at the moment, just looking at America, the, in, the impact of the internet is a lot of it is on consumer. Business, not there's still space to grow. Uh, warfare, <laughs> there's, we're only halfway there. You know? There are more wars that we can fight. Uh, education is 15%. Let me tell you, education is so dear, far behind. Healthcare is the same. Until Apple kicks in with the, the, the apps for and that connects to your phone and your watch. And lastly, get government regulation policy thinking. That's the last. The internet is the last to get into government. So the growth potential is still huge. So everything that we talked about, there's still a lot more to grow. And where is it? Ethereum and all this, obviously it's everywhere. Okay. So when you think about it, there's a lot you can do. I'm not the tech guy, but I talk about people and looking at the markets. And I understand tech through people. My understanding of people. So then the question is this, I'll do a simple uh, 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 example. How do you sell it to people 3.0? It's not actually people 3.0. It's, it's basically how do you sell it to people? How do you sell complex ideas to people? You've got to simplify it. And how do you sell complex technical uh, uh, innovations to people? Again, you've got to uh, simplify it, make it relevant to the person. You can't sell the technology. You can if you're talking to tech people, but to the average consumer, don't sell the technology. You don't sell them purely on the rational reasons. Like you don't just go, here's this vacuum machine, you can do so much. There needs to be an emotional reason, okay? Um, and I say like marriage. I love marriage as a as an analogy uh, because I've learned so much from marriage. <laughs> <laughs> but marriage is, how many of you are dating? Who's dating? What? Don't be shy. Now, somebody has to be, okay, you're dating. How do you decide? You there's a rational layer. You decide, you know, long hair, a short hair. You know, for the woman, you wear like the sea shower, even you know, <laughs> different things. But those are the rational reasons, right? You do these things. At the end of it, what makes you take the plunge? It's not the rational thing. It's, it can't be. Oh, does he have a car, condo, country club, and he showers every day? So therefore, that's it. At the end of it, what makes you decide is the emotional reason, which is, are you in love with the person or not? Okay? Also, it depends on the stage of society. If this was Singapore right after World War II, there was no place for love. It was like, do you have two hands and two feet? Okay, let's get it on, because we've got to start family. Okay? So those are different times. But now, in the age of plenty, we look at these things. So the rational reasons get you to consider, but it's the emotional ones that gets you to make the decision and to come in. 
So if you look at uh, Ethereum, what I, I just used this example, do you call this a platform for zero trust interaction system, which is what it is? Or do you say Ethereum gives you trust in a zero trust interaction system? See, okay. as we were talking about it, what would you pay for trust? You pay a lot of money for trust. So it's how you position whatever you're developing, whatever you're thinking of, in a relevant way with the right kind of emotional pool that shows you understand the consumer. Part of it was I outlined what the principles are and then package it for them. All right? So if I were to leave you with one thought, be two words, think exponentially. Everything we talk about, I think the adoption rate, we think, oh, it'll be five years before people get it. Give yourself two and a half years because people are expanding at an uh, exponential rate. Maybe you missed the mark. Maybe it is five years, okay? But at least you're prepared already. You're out there. So that time span will keep shrinking and shrinking. It's not going to lengthen. So what we're talking about might be leading age now. In two and a half years, it might be commonplace. Don't forget, in 2007, Nokia laughed at Apple. Yeah, who wants to? <laughs> Nokia then was worth uh, 200 billion euros. Number one uh, phone company in the world. In 2013, which is six years later, they were sold to Microsoft for 15 and a half billion dollars. So exponential change happens exponentially. The thing that's stopping us is just here. So as long as you readjust and recalibrate, you'll be prepared for it. Thank you very much. Questions? Question. Yeah. No, not from me. No. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Um, what's something that uh, you used to be used to be worried about, but you're not worried about anymore? And part two, what's something that you think the world should be worried about that you're worried about? <laughs> <laughs> what I used to be worried about, and I'm no longer worried about. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was. A... <laughs> um, I you could say I've been married so long. I'm not worried about losing that marriage anymore. Because she's already you know whatever. We're 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 too entrenched that uh, it doesn't matter. I, I it, 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 so I'm not worried about that. Okay, it's not irrelevant. Uh, it's very deep, huh? Um, I'll tell you what, I, uh, I was talking about this earlier, um, because I have young kids, my son's 12, I was very worried about his future, because the current education system is geared towards the industrial age, putting someone in a slot within the manufacturing process. So I was worried about his future, which is, what will, he, what will happen when he graduates from school, whether it's university, who knows whether even universities are a viable concept then. So will they're, they're teaching him and preparing him for a job that doesn't exist yet. Or when he's training to be an architect, by the time he graduates, that job becomes obsolete. So that used to worry me. Then I kind of over time figured out that maybe I shouldn't worry about the job. I should just prepare him with the values that will prepare him for the future. So when I look at the 21st century principles, I think the most important values the, the young children should have now is creativity, the ability to think imaginatively, which we, the system, our current system here in Singapore is about model answers. Model answers means one answer only, one way to get there. There's no creativity. They in fact conditions creativity now. That's one. Uh, adaptability. Uh, the ability to change quickly and evolve quickly. Uh, empathy. Empathy is very important because if he starts a business and we're, we're talking about the democratization of business, he's got to understand 
the customer very quickly. And the empathy has to be a global one. I have to, he, he has to, he has to also be well traveled. So he, he can go, okay, I'm selling this to Vietnam. Take off my shoes, be a Vietnamese consumer and go, what does he want? What is he looking for? Curiosity. If he loses that curiosity, then all that knowledge that's out there will be lost. Everything out there. So the question I ask you is, there's no, perf there's no way to answer this, but if uh, Sir Thomas Edison was still alive and there's Wikipedia and there's Google search, you know, how much more could he have invented? So if he didn't have, if he's no, no one's curious, that's all wasted. Um, then resilience. You need to be resilient because there's, th those are still old fashioned val values. You still got to keep persevering. Uh, for me, the last one is the, um, uh, to embrace failure. The failure is part of the journey to success. The current system here is failure is failure and it stops that. In America, when, if you're a VC, uh, and this is specifically to the Singaporeans here, uh, in America, when you're a VC, you look at two startups, you ask the startup one, how many times have you failed? And they go, uh, 10 times. Two, the other one, how many times have you failed? Oh, I've never started. This is my first time. The valuation for the guy who's failed 10 times is higher. But in Singapore, it's very different. Oh my God, you failed 10 <coughs> times. You, you won't even fail 10 times. You failed two and you're out again, right? And they would rather invest in the person who has never failed before. But it, starting a business is like riding a bicycle. So if you had 100 bucks, who would you bet on? The guy who has tried to ride a bike 10 times or the guy who has never ridden a bike at all? He's more likely to ride the bike, right? Okay. So that, that mindset needs to change. What worries me? Um, I suppose, what is the concept of nations? What is the future of a country? 10 years from now, 20 years from now. Why is that? We don't know. Can I still be Singaporean but live in Chiang Mai? Because I could work anywhere, assuming. All I need is a high speed broadband. <laughs> so those are the things that, I, it doesn't keep me awake. I, you know, I sleep very well. <laughs> Very few of them are. Very few of them are. Because uh, currently, from my experience, if you're in a job here, you're here posted for two years, and it will be someone else's problem. So you just have to make your numbers for, for it is and then move on and someone else's problem. But so very few of them think that way because a lot of the top corporate leaders are still in the 20th century mentality of I'm in control, I'm in charge. So no, <coughs> usually what happens is they wait for someone to innovate and buy them and then kill them or the smart ones buy them. The really smart ones will buy them and then offer that service to their customers. By my experience, no. The take-up rate will happen when, usually, forgive my language, when shit hits the fan, then they'll change. So it's the Titanic analogy that it, it takes a long time to turn, but it has to be a huge iceberg coming, then they will turn. Because they think any small iceberg, they can crush it. Yes. I'm asking this for the startups because I'm interested to see what do you mean? What do I do? <laughs> I do everything and nothing. I, I can tell you from, from my uh, when I left the corporate world three years ago, the prime motivation was to, to spend more time with the children because. Time is, time is the new money. I was flying uh, three weeks out of the month around Asia and, and, and Europe and America. So I couldn't get to see them grow up. So my son was then uh, eight. So by the time he becomes, a, how many of you have teenage show, children? They don't want you near them, right? <laughs> when, once they become teenagers, the doors are locked. So I didn't want to get to that stage. So when he... When my daughter and him are teenagers and they don't want me around, I'll go back to work. 
doesn't matter. But <laughs> in that three years of, 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 of uh, sabbatical, I have done a lot of things. I have uh, done a lot of urban farming. We're designing a stackable pot system to work in uh, HDB flats uh, because food, food security is an issue. Uh, we're working with, uh, we're designing a, a capillary effect kind of feeding system for the pots as well. Um, I'm writing a book, uh, uh, with a children's book with my son. He's illustrated it, so we should be publishing it, printed before end July. Uh, and it, the book is about self-confidence, because I think a lot of the kids lack that. And that's what you want to encourage. Uh, I've done an app uh, called Time Traveler. Uh, I've invested in a few companies and, and advised a few companies along the way. And I consult like that. Still of marketing, etc. So I, I do everything, and, and you could say and nothing. I do a lot of cooking because <laughs> the farming is important because you want to eat fresh food. And from a philosophical point of view, I don't want to bore you. It will finish very quickly. Is I want the children to understand that nature is a circle, and they cannot be too far removed from it. Because when they are too far removed from it, we don't see a consequence of our actions. So we continue to drink, eat, drive. And then the world will keep getting hotter. And we're like, why? 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 So these little things, when they can see it, they understand there's a consequence to everything. Anything else? No? Thank you very much. So thank you very much for your attention. I hope you guys really enjoyed to see the talk we brought to you. And uh, if you have any questions or any other matter, you can just reach out to us or reach out to developers if you have met them over the break. And for tomorrow, we have a workshop that's going on for, uh, that will be led by the Ethereum team. We'll be doing a mini workshop over three to four hours where you'll be learning to understand a little bit more about the blockchain technologies model and framework. So you are, if you are coming for tomorrow's event, it's still on the meetup page. It's on, the level, it's on level four and seminar room 4.3. It will start at around 6.45 again. And please do bring your laptops with chargers. Yeah. And of course, we have a, on Saturday, we have a pub crawl event. It's open to all. I understand it's a long weekend. Some of you guys can be away. So if you are interested to join us, just uh, look, look us up on the meetup group. Yeah. Okay, so tomorrow's session is open to all levels. Yeah, I myself, so I'm like, we will be a participant tomorrow as well. So yeah, so it's open to all levels. You don't have to be uh, that high level i guess yeah. <laughs> so uh yeah hope to see you tomorrow and have a good night thank you, thank you. Thank you.